For the second time in three years, Tasmania's Premier has rolled the dice on a very early election. Tonight, the people's verdict. Former Premier Peter Gutwin made history in 2021 by winning a third Liberal term by the slimmest of margins. But within a year, Gutwin was gone, citing exhaustion as the reason for his surprise resignation from politics. For his successor, Jeremy Rockcliffe, it's been a bumpy term, forced into minority government after barely a year in the top job, when two Liberal MPs quit the party and joined the crossbench. The Premier says he's called today's early election because an agreement he struck with those two had broken down. After years in the doldrums, can Rebecca White's Labor Party capitalise on the government chaos? And will the new bigger parliament also bring with it an expanded crossbench? This campaign has thrown up countless questions about Tasmania's future and tonight it's the voters' turn to deliver some answers. Live across the country from Nipaluna Hobart, this is Tasmania Votes. Hello and welcome to the last remaining tally room in Australia here at the Grand Chancellor Hotel in Hobart. I'm Sabra Lang. And I'm Guy Stainer. It's fantastic to have your company. The time for pundits and opinion polls has officially ended. Booths across Tasmania are now closed, which means that we will soon get the people's verdict. And who better to bring us up to the minute analysis of tonight's count than the ABC's chief election analyst, Anthony Green. Welcome back to T Tasmania, Anthony. A little sooner than expected. One big change this year is the bigger parliament. How do you think that's going to impact this election result? Well, I think we'll start first by looking at the existing parliament. Um, that the 25-seat parliament um, the, that was elected last time, the Liberal Party got just under 50% of the vote, but only got a one-seat majority, 13 of the 25 seats, Labor 9, Greens 2 and others 1. What's happened since then has actually been why there is an early election. Two Liberal members deserted the crossbench. David O'Byrne parted ways with the Labor Party and joined the crossbench. So the Liberals were down to 11, and the justification for calling the election was that the government had lost control of the chamber. Of course, what is happening this time is the chamber is going up from 25 to 35 members. In each of the five divisions, there will be seven members elected in seven of five. The quota for election comes from 16.7 to 12.5 per cent. And Anthony, with more seats up for grabs in each electorate, there are also a lot more candidates than we're used to seeing in Tasmania. There's a record 167 candidates. Now, it's not so much the increase in candidates that's the, the, the issue. I mean, 30 of those are just simply the Labor and Liberal and Greens standing seven candidates per division instead of five. What's happened at this election is that there was only two groups last time with single independents in. That was Sue Hickey and Christy Johnson in Clark. At this election, there's a record 14. It's not the increase in candidates the issue, it's the increase in columns on the ballot paper. And so that's going to actually slow down the count along with the extra preferences and also makes the between party preferences, between group preferences more interesting because people have to mark seven preferences. And anybody who votes for these independents and the smaller groups like Jackie Lambie Network, they're only standing three in each division. If they are excluded in the count, they have preferences and they go elsewhere. And normally at Tasmanian elections, there isn't a great input of between between party preferences. Thanks, Anthony, for that. Let's introduce you to the panel that we've assembled here tonight to help you make sense of the results and what they mean for the state. ABC reporter Emily Baker has covered Tasmanian politics since 2018 and has won Journalist of the Year twice. Em, welcome back. Thanks Elections up, are always exciting affairs, but Jeremy Rockcliffe and Rebecca White would be pretty nervous about now. Absolutely, Sabra. Tonight we find out whether Jeremy Rockcliffe's scamble has paid off, whether he'll be returning to the Tasmanian Parliament as Premier with an unprecedented fourth-term government and a majority, or if he might wake up tomorrow with perhaps a sore head and in a coalition of chaos, as he might describe it. We'll find out whether Tasmanian Labor has restored its brand and earned the trust of Tasmanian voters, or whether Rebecca White is heading to her third straight election loss. 
whether the Greens can lift their vote above 12%, securing more seats. And of course, really fascinating to see what that crossbench might look like. There might be some new faces there, but this could be a, a bit of a game changer for Tasmanian politics for the years to come. And morning's presenter for ABC Radio Hobart and across northern Tasmania is Leon Compton, who's been travelling around Tasmania, talking to candidates in every seat. Leon, you've also been hearing from voters. What have they had to say? Yeah, Guy, we've been talking to literally hundreds of voters over the last five weeks. And as always happens in Tasmanian elections, there's a real focus on the basics. People want access to a hospital that works. They want to know that there is a GP somewhere near them that they can get into if they're sick. People talk about quality of schools and decent roads. What parents pushing prams and grandparents pushing prams are telling us a lot at the moment is their community desperately needs better access to childcare, and that's come up in the course of this campaign. We'll talk about that. And the stadium, too, has made it onto a lot of lists, particularly the further you get away from Hobart. There has been an interest in talking about independence. What we have not felt, and it may not be borne out in the polls, there is no sense of baseball bats on the front lawn waiting to take on this government and no real call to give the other guys a go, no real call for a vote for Labor. Um, and a lot of people have been talking about the disengagement in this campaign and I think there's a reason for that and it's the old adage that people give you about parenting. After a while, children don't worry about what you say they look at what you do. And this is a government now that's had 10 years to show what it does, and people will be making their decision tonight based on their judgment of that. Thanks, Leon. Now, let's bring in the rest of our panel. Throughout the night, no matter how long we go for, we're going to be with us, joined by, with us by the former federal Liberal Senator and now state candidate, Liberal candidate for Franklin, Erica Betts. Labor's Sarah Lovell, a member of Tasmania's Upper House for Legislative Council. Welcome, Sarah. Thanks, Guy. Lovely to be here. And Green Senator Nick McKim, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Sabra. Now, Erica Betts, I'm going to start with you. Jeremy Rockcliffe called this election early, saying that his relationship with the former Liberal two MPs had broken down. He said that he needed to um, go to the election because it was a, a, a minority government too weak. Do you think, give your side much of a chance of gaining a majority tonight? You always have to hope for a majority. The polls suggest that might be difficult, but there is a pathway to a majority government. If we capture five seats in uh, Braddon, which has happened in the past, four in Bass, four in Lyons, uh, three in Franklin, two in Clark, hopefully we can get there. But uh, we start with 11 seats, so let's keep that in mind. Uh, so we are quite a way behind. We have to make up a lot of ground tonight. I would like to think we could bank 14 seats. Um, 16 I think is quite realistic as well. Getting to the 18 seats is going to be a huge ask and task but uh, let's see what our fellow Tasmanians have determined. Thank you Eric. To you Sarah Lovell, this is a third term government. For the second time in a row they've called an early election the government has been largely dysfunctional for the last year or so, and yet somehow Labor is still well behind in the polls. Why is the Labor brand so on the nose with the Tasmanian public? Well, Guy, I don't think that it is that the Labor brand is on the nose with the public. I think what we're seeing in Tasmania play out is really a continuation of a trend that we've seen in politics right around the country, where people are looking for alternatives in independents and other minor parties. Um, this election has really very clearly been a choice between the Liberal government and on the other side there's a whole smorgasbord of people to choose from, including the Labor Party. So there are a lot more options for people there if they don't want to vote Liberal. That might be reflected in the polls. Uh, but also, you know, we're waiting to see what results come in because I think there's a lot that's unpredictable about tonight's election. It's a pretty historic night going back to the 35 seats. A big test for Jeremy Rockcliffe's leadership <coughs> given the reasons that he's gone to the second early election, as you've described. Um, so we're waiting to see what comes through as those results come through. Nick McKinn, the expansion of the chamber means that the quota required to be elected is dropped. That should benefit the Greens, but if you can't win a seat in every electorate tonight, does that mean that you've failed? 
Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, and it's a bit of a myth that this uh, increase in the size of Parliament benefits the Greens. It benefits everybody. Uh, it makes it easier for independents. It makes it easier for the second or third Labor or Liberal candidate to get elected. But overall, tonight, very difficult to see a pathway to majority government for either of the Coles and Woolworths of Australian politics. And there's every chance that tonight a lot of Tasmanians will be celebrating a vibrant, dynamic, accountable transparent parliament where no one party has absolute power and power is shared and the corporate vested interests that have uh, that have tr destroyed this state for such a long time will not be able to do their secret deals with Labor and Liberal governments behind closed doors and it will be happening on the floor of the parliament where that where it should actually be happening. Nick McKim there'll be a lot more to hear from our panel tonight. We're approaching 10 minutes past six which means counting is now underway across the state and we should start to get first figures in the next half an hour or so. Watching the count in Hobart is Lucy MacDonald. Lucy there's plenty of action happening behind you but with more candidates on the ballot is it likely to be a more time consuming process for those electoral workers we can see? Well, Guy, the Electoral Commission is nothing if not prompt. At six o'clock on the dot, we heard a call ring out. The votes were, pour the votes were poured out and they have started counting behind me. Now, fun fact, uh, the team behind me are counting the sprawling electorate of Lions, which of course runs all the way from the south to the north. And upstairs, we've got the Hobart-based electorate of Clark and Franklin. Um, you know, we had more than three, almost 300,000 Tasmanians walk through the doors to vote in polling booths today, while more than a quarter of the state also voted early, which was a record. As Anthony Green mentioned earlier, um, we had a record 167 candidates in this election. Now, that's probably because we're seeing that expanded 35-seat House. With that lower quota, um, people have a you know, better chance of getting elected. And, um, it also means that you've got 10 vacant seats, which, you know, obviously the major parties are hoping to nab more. We've also got these independents hoping to get them for the first time. But it's not the number of candidates that, um, that is the problem with uh, delaying the counting. It's the number of sort of columns on, um, on the voting document. <laughs> um, it's number of columns. Um, and it's also the fact that you need, um, you've got this preference flow because you've got seven candidates in each, um, in each electorate. So the TEC says they should should have some first results trickling in about quarter to seven tonight. By the end of the night, they said you might have an idea of about 10 to 15 candidates, but that's just an idea. As for who will form government, well, that could take a while longer. Lucy MacDonald, thank you. Well, Anthony, while we wait for the first figures to arrive from Lucy's counting station there, can you please explain for the mainlanders watching on that Tasmanian elections are a little different? Can you explain how the Hare Clark system works? This is like asking Jim Maxwell to explain Duckworth Lewis, I think. But it's like a, <laughs> <laughs> the map, uh, this is the five electorates. These are the five federal divisions you've heard of Bass, Braddon, Franklin, Lyons, and Clark. So Bass up here in the northwest, northeast, is mainly Launceston. Braddon, the whole northwest coast and the west coast. Lions are an electorate of regions. It's got the East Coast, Derwent Valley, Northern and Southern Midlands, the orbits of Northern Hobart. You've got Franklin, which is a rather odd electorate, including Clarence to the east of Hobart and Kingston to the south. And then the last electorate is Clark, the central Hobart electorate. Now, at the last election, for a 13-seat and a one-seat majority, the Liberal Party won three, three of the five seats in Bass, in Braddon and Lyons, and they won two each in Clark and Franklin. So to win this time, that's what the government needs to do. It needs to win four in at least three seats and three in the other two. And uh, the opinion polling, as it's dropped off, makes it much harder to win four. You need basically 50% of the vote to win a majority of seats in the state. So that's the contest. So we'll be filling in these seats tonight. What we do on the night is we start looking at the vote by party. Um, it's, it's a candidate-based system, but you can sort of aggregate the vote by party and get a rough idea of how many seats each of the parties will elect. If the Labor gets three and a half quotas or the Liberals three and a half quotas, they're probably going to elect three members and be in the race for a fourth. If the Greens get 0.8 of a quota, they're in the race for, for a seat, or 1.5, they're in a race for second. So we'll look at the votes by party first. As the 
figures come in, you start to get a handle on how many votes each candidate has got, and you can start to determine from that ticket who are the candidates likely to get. Now, early on, we'll get some candidates who get well over a quota. Jeremy Rockliffe will be one. Uh, um, Rebecca White will be another. Probably Michael Ferguson. Maybe even Eric Betts in Franklin. We'll see. Uh, we've got Jackie Petrus from there, who's got a quota in her own right before. So some of those people will be obviously elected. It's then beyond them who who gets elected. So we start on early the early rotations around these seats. We'll be talking about party vote, and then later in the evening we'll be dissecting the party tickets as well, as well as looking at those individual independents. What does it mean, Anthony, for how quickly you'll be able to start calling seats? Uh, look, to, to be honest, we could call two seats for Labor and Liberal in just about every electorate already. Both of the major parties will get 20 to 30 per cent. The Greens will get a quota in Franklin and Clark. We'll wait until we get some votes to do that. But, you know, 10 to 12 seats will go pretty quickly. And then beyond that, you start to give them away as the vote firms up and as we start to pick candidates themselves. Okay. We've got reporters in key parts of the state who will bring us instant reaction to the results. Let's head to the Liberal Party election night function right now. Reporter Jano Gibson's there. And Jano, Jeremy Rockcliffe took a real gamble in calling in an early election. Uh, what are the Liberals you're talking to? What are they telling you? Are they optimistic that that's going to pay off? Well, Sabra, unfortunately, I can't tell you what the mood is like here in the election function room behind me. And that's because the Liberals have blocked access to the media tonight, so very much a closed affair with the Liberals. But having spoken to Liberal Party insiders, they are very confident that at the very least they'll be able to secure more seats than the Labor Party by the end of the count tonight. Somewhere between 14, maybe 15, maybe 16 seats. Certainly not enough to reach that uh, majority figure of 18 seats, but it will set them up to be able to try and form a minority government if they can get the support or at least a guarantee from uh, some of the members of the crossbenchers, the independents and the minor parties that uh, might emerge as winners tonight. Uh, but it's important to remember that when Jeremy Rockliffe rolled the dice some five and a half weeks ago and called this early election, he did urge Tasmanians to elect a majority Liberal government and he warned that a minority government would uh, be destabilising for Tasmania and certainly at this stage the polls are suggesting that uh, a minority li Liberal government is the most likely outcome. So not quite the stability and certainty that Jeremy Rockliffe was looking for, but if they do end up winning it will be the fourth time in a row that the Liberals have won government and that will be a record here in Tasmania. Thanks Jano. Well, monitoring the Labor camp for us tonight is reporter Liz Gwynn. Liz, how hopeful are Labor sources that Rebecca White can make it third time lucky tonight? Good evening, Guy. I had hoped to cross you from inside the Labor function, but unfortunately I got a call late yesterday to say that we wouldn't be allowed in because it is a private event. Now, this is unusual and I haven't been given a clear reason as to why this decision was made. But I've been on the phones instead, Guy, and I've been making calls to Labor sources and they tell me that they are quietly optimistic. They say that the community, that there's a real sense and people have have told them that they are in the mood for change but whether or not this translates to a vote for Labor well that does remain to be seen now Labor leader Rebecca White well she's been campaigning hard right up until the, today and she really does want to win majority government she's really been pushing uh, for cost addressing cost of living pressures but she's also been saying that she will help to improve the state's health system now in particular ambulance ramping which has been a major issue here in Tasmania. It's been a big day for the Labor leader. Understandably she'd be quite nervous uh, seeing those results coming in tonight and in the coming days and even a week as well to get a clearer picture. She's led Labor to two election losses and it will there will be a lot of questions over her future if Labor loses again Guy. Liz Gwynn thank you. At Greens headquarters is our reporter, Madeleine Rojan. Maddie, the Greens, how are people feeling about the first campaign with Rosalie Woodruff at the helm? 
Well, I can say firstly that it's quite a good party here. I'm enjoying it. And the Greens have had a very exciting campaign with Rosalie Woodruff at the helm. They say they've spoken really well for Tasmanians and for the environment, which they say sets them apart from other parties. Now, the volunteers also, they have been working so hard across the whole state and those, those efforts have been concentrated in the north where currently they don't have any seats but with the expansion of parliament back to 35 seats they're hoping to pick up a seat each in Bass and in Lyons. Braddon there's a bit more of a battle against the Liberal Party and the Jackie Lambie network but you know they're hoping they can do it. Anything can happen this election. Madeline Roseanne thank you and good to see someone actually getting inside a function. And in Launceston at the Lambie network at that function is our reporter Monty Boval. Monty, depending on what poll you're looking at, Jackie Lambie's party is drawing between 8 and 10 per cent of the vote. How confident are they of converting that support into seats in Parliament? Well, Guy, there's certainly a level of optimism here in the room at the Jackie Lambie Network function in Launceston. Certainly the, the uh, party is hopeful of maybe picking up a few seats in this new parliament. Um, maybe Braddon being considered as their best chance. Also Lyons as well, uh, certainly from the uh, conversations that I have. But the questions uh, that this party is asking is, are there candidates high profile enough? Uh, that, that's something they're really proud of though, something that, that these candidates are everyday people and uh, they're not the high profile political names that you would normally hear. The second question is, uh, will Jackie Lambie's brand or will Jackie Lambie's name be enough to get some of these quest uh, candidates across the line? So certainly it will be a very interesting result to come in. Uh, and, and the next question will be uh, what uh, the Jackie Lambie network would do if they do form uh, a balance of power position in the new parliament. Thank Monty you there. Thank, yeah. you. thank you, Monty, and thank you to all of our reporters. Also tonight here in the tally room, we have Selena Ross. You're at a big board. What's it going to show us tonight, Selena? So that's right, Sabra, this is the big board. And tonight it's going to be giving us the big picture, an overview of the state of play as the results are coming in. And now, as you heard from Anthony, we have five electorates in Tasmania and each of those have seven seats. So each of the squares you're going to see here represents one seat. And as the results come in, as seats are called, they're going to fill up with either a face or a party colour to show who's won that seat. Now, to show you what we mean, we're going to bring in the results of the 2021 one election so that you get an idea of how it's going to look. We're also going to talk you through what's been happening over the past three years because there have been plenty of changes in that time. So before, as soon as the election result was declared that year, Adam Brooks quit in Braddon as replaced by Felix Ellis. Then we had David O'Byrne ousted from the Parliamentary Labor Party and turn independent. In 2022, we had the Education Minister, Sarah Courtney, quit and be replaced by Lara Alexander. Just two months later, the Premier, Peter Gutwin, quit and was replaced by Simon Wood. Then we had the Police Minister, Jackie Petrusma, quit and replaced by Dean Young. Then we get to last year and 2023 it was quite a tumultuous year, particularly for the Liberals. The biggest thing that happened was that Lara Alexander in Bass and John Tucker in Lyons both quit the Liberal Party and threw the government into a minority and led us eventually to here tonight to this early election. We also had the Greens leader Cassie O'Connor quit in Clark and be replaced by Vicar Bailey. And we had the Attorney General Elise Archer quit and be replaced by Simon Barakas. So as you can see there, since 2021, around a third of the people who were elected that year have either gone or they've turned independent. So today has been a chance for Tasmanians to decide who they want to see on the floor of the parliament. So right now we're going to clear the board and go back to the start. And Sky and Sabra, we're going to wait to see those faces as they start popping up as the results come in. Thank you, Selena. And it will be fascinating to see what happens with that big board throughout the night. Erica Betts, throughout this campaign, the Liberal Party has campaigned on stable majority government. What that big board shows is that electing a Liberal government paves the way for anything but stability. 
Well, I don't think so. Well, what people understand is that uh, if they vote for a stable majority Liberal government, that that is what they expect. And when that no longer occurs, when John Tucker and Lara Alexander did what they did, it no longer worked, and therefore the Premier called the election. But look, uh, let's keep in mind, the Greens leader, Cassie O'Connor, left. You had a recount. David O'Byrne had his issues with the Labor Party. So this is not a uniquely Liberal thing. I think it's a unique uh, Tasmanian political thing where people do switch out of parties, into parties, whatever. And my own view is that uh, if you're with a party, you stick with a party, irrespective of what may be done to you, because that's what you sign up for. And that's what the Premier has asked the people of Tasmania to consider. Sarah Lovell, I'm going to go to you. Uh, Labor's got eight seats to win a majority in the new expanded parliament. You need to bring that up to 18. That's a 10-seat net gain without losing any. Is that really achievable? Look, there's no doubt we're starting from a long way where we need to be to be in majority government. Um, but so is the Liberal Party. And this really is a test for Jeremy Rockcliffe and his leadership. He's gone to an early election on the basis that we need stable majority government. It's looking increasingly unlikely that any major party will get to that point. Um, we've been very realistic about that all the way through. Uh, the question I think tonight will be who will be best placed to work with those minor parties and independents to form a workable and cohesive and collaborative parliament. Well, as we've already heard, this has been a short but tumultuous term for the Liberal government. There have been so many changes to the party room since the 2021 election that it's been often difficult to keep up. Ellie Ward looks back at the last three years in Tasmanian politics. In May 2021, Peter Gutwin steered the Liberals to an historic third term. Tasmanians had been sent to the polls a year early after the Liberals lost their majority following the sacking of former Speaker Sue Hickey. I have never been more certain that our state's best days are still in front of us. But in under a year, Mr Gutwin quit, citing the desire to spend more time with his family and that he had nothing left to give. Three more members of Cabinet quit within a year of the election, all citing personal reasons for the decision. The perennial deputy Jeremy Rockliffe took the helm of a less than steady ship, but things were to get more rocky. Liberal backbenchers John Tucker and Lara Alexander moved to the crossbench over transparency concerns, particularly around the proposed $715 million AFL stadium, plunging the government into minority. You stop the stadium, you stop the team and you kill the dream. Then Attorney General Elise Archer quit after being ousted from Cabinet over bullying allegations, throwing Rockcliffe's minority government into further disarray. But threats by the former Liberals turned independents to bring down the government, prompted Mr Rockliffe to pull the election trigger last month. The parliament has become unworkable. What do we want? Care. When do we want it? Now. After 10 years in power with crises in health, housing and a damning commission of inquiry into government responses to child sexual abuse, on paper it should be curtains for the Liberal government. But the opposition has struggled to prove it's up to the task. Tasmanian Labor hasn't been able to govern itself. Former Senators Nick Sherry and Doug Cameron were appointed as administrators two years ago after years of bitter division and factional infighting. Only last month was it put back in charge of its own affairs. With polls suggesting neither major party will win a majority in their own right, attention has turned to potential deals with the Greens, minor parties and independents. I will not agree uh, to anything that constrains me or uh, my government. Neither party may have a choice. Tasmania's lower house returns to 35 members at this election. It was cut to 25 in 1998 in a bid by the Liberals and Labor to prevent the Greens from gaining the balance of power. But across the political spectrum, it was acknowledged the move resulted in more minders and unelected backroom players, a lack of ministerial talent and politicians burning out. The increase means candidates need fewer votes to achieve a quota. 
boosting the likelihood of minor parties and independents. And if the polls are right and Tasmanians again elect a minority government, whichever party wins the most seats will have to play ball. Now, as we said earlier, we're coming to you live from the last remaining tally room in the country. Until recently, every state, te territory and federal election had a room like this one, a place where the results of the night would be displayed on large boards for members of the media and the public to see. Now, this is the ABC's federal election broadcast way back in 1996 from the tally room, Anthony featuring a slightly younger looking Anthony Green back then. Anthony, you must miss all those other tally rooms. Uh, not, not particularly, it's a lot harder. It's a lot harder to work in a tally room, especially with the volumes of data and the computer technology we use nowadays. And I must say, looking at that archival footage, that tie's looking yes, pretty familiar. We, uh, we did dig it out as a special occasion. <laughs> um, the, that, the last, uh, well, that was the 1996 election. One week earlier was the Tasmanian election. One of the difficulties with tally rooms is getting the space to do them and getting the time to do it. So, for instance, this has been constructed since yesterday. They had a conference on zooplankton all week. In 1996, we didn't get in until uh, till midnight on the polling day. They had... Um, Manpower Australian, the male stripper troupe, was on the night before. <laughs> and um, where we had the computers set up off the stage was between there and the dressing room. So we were trying to do all the computers with these um, scantily clad men coming in this way and then sort of going out with even less on afterwards. So uh, there are difficulties doing tally rooms, I must say, but uh, it's nice to come back to one. Quite the mental picture. <laughs> <laughs> the naked truth of politics. <laughs> Uh, now, helping us bring you all the colour and movement from the tally room floor is our reporter, Alexandra Alvaro. Alex, great to see you. It's a bit quiet now, but tell us what this room will be like quite soon. It should be full of people soon. Yeah, and they're already starting to stream in. This has got to be the best place to be on election night. How lucky are we to be host to the last tally room in the country, a place where members of the public can come in, young and old, from all walks of life, and basically watch the democratic process play out. They can see the results stream in in real time. And I can give you a little tour for those uh, watching back home. Of course, behind me, not too far away, we've got the panel. Give us a wave if you can, Guy and Sabra. <laughs> Hello. Um, fueled, of course, by copious amounts of sugar, which you probably couldn't see from that other angle. <laughs> um, and then behind me, we've got the big boards. This is where, candidate by candidate, we've got the breakdown of votes, where people in real time, as I say, will start to see those votes stream in. And you can see there are already a lot of people here to watch that happen. And then we have the podium. This is where both leaders will either make their concession speech or their victory speech towards the end of the night. Of course, when that will happen will be anyone's guess. But Somebody who knows uh, quite a bit about elections is, of course, the Electoral Commissioner, Andrew Hawkey, uh, who joins me now. Andrew, this is the third time that Tasmanians have gone to the polls in six years. Are you a bit tired? Uh, we're getting used to it. Uh, we know what we're doing, and it's great to have everyone, including the ABC, back uh, for another telling room. And why is it so important that we keep this tally room tradition alive? It's been going for such a long time. Why is it so important? I think it really is a, a symbol of the tradition and the fact that people uh, have voted and now they come to see the results. The leaders come, which is fantastic, to the place and so they respond to the results. It's, it's a beautiful thing for Tasmania. Fantastic. And of course, this time we have the expanded parliament. Did that present a bit of a challenge uh, for the commission this time around or maybe a little bit of extra work? It adds to the complexity. Our ballot papers are deeper, our screens behind us are deeper, uh, and, but our counting will be a bit slower because formality is not one to five anymore, it's one to seven. And so, and the name, there are more names to check. So it'll take a bit longer, unfortunately, to get the results through, but hopefully they'll all come through tonight. And so on that note, what does the next week look like for you? So we'll have hopefully all our polling places and our early votes in tonight or early tomorrow and then we have to do the rechecking. So with complex ballot papers and preferences all over the place, we'll do some auditing of the ballot papers, we'll bring in overseas and interstate voting, we'll bring in telephone voting and so hopefully by Easter Tuesday when the 10 day period for postal voting is over, we'll start the hair clerk count which will probably take five or six days from there. Okay, so definitely not over tonight. Yeah. Andrew Hawkey, thank you so much for your insights. Uh, have a great night. And back to you, Guy and Sabra. Alex, thank you very much for that. And Andrew Hawkey, thank you, thanks to you too. Now, Nick McKim, I want to come to you. You've got an interesting perspective for us tonight because many people may not realise before being a federal senator, you were actually in the Tasmanian parliament and you 
were part of a minority government. I was. Given that minority government might be in the offing very shortly in our history, what will you be looking at specifically? Well, um, I mean, as I said earlier, I, I think a pathway to majority is going to be really difficult for either Labor or Liberal. And to be honest, they've failed Tasmania pretty badly for a long period of time now. And I think people are just disillusioned with the major parties. This is a, a long-term trend we've seen at, at a national level where uh, the share of the vote uh, of the two major parties is in consistent and constant decline and I'd expect tonight will be a pretty major nail in the coffin of the two-party system and I think a lot of Tasmanians will be really happy about that. Look, in terms of what we can expect, uh, you hear a lot of posturing uh, before polling day. We've seen it from Rebecca White. We've seen it from Jeremy Rockliffe. They'll be ruled, they've ruled out a lot of things and uh, I think they're going to find themselves potentially in a very difficult position because they've put their personal imprimatur on the things that they are not prepared to do and it may yet be that their parties will need them to do those things in order to get the numbers to form a government. So I think uh, tonight, tonight will be interesting but the next few weeks very interesting indeed. Could well be a talking point that we pick up in the next couple of hours. Well, we're about to cross to the seat of Bass, and joining us is the Deputy Premier, Michael Ferguson, who's at his home in Trevellan. And I believe it's a happy 50th birthday to yeah. you, Michael Ferguson. Yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> it is my birthday today, and I'm surrounded by the people I love, my wonderful family, my wife Julie, my incredible parents and our three children, we're all together, plus um, so many friends and well wishes. So yeah, it's a special day for us. Happy birthday. Is it more birthday party or election party? Oh, well, I was waiting for you to say happy birthday. Thank you, Guy. <laughs> uh, it's both. We're celebrating our team efforts tonight and, you know, working with our BAS colleagues, all seven of them, wonderful people. Uh, and their teams. It's been really a great experience for me. I'm, I've been around Hare Clark elections for a, a few times now and for me this has been one of the best uh, in the sense of teamwork, working with our Premier Jeremy Rockliffe and our team of the decade around the state. Uh, we don't just say that, we mean it. They're great people and it's been an election that we've been very proud to fight. Can I, can I quickly chime in and well, uh, wish Michael Ferguson a very happy birthday but he's not alone. Jackie Petrusma and Dean Young are also enjoying their birthdays today. So we've got three Liberal candidates up today enjoying their birthdays. Is that the real reason why we've gone to an early election? <laughs> to line up with all of your birthday parties? No, no, it is one of those things that happens, well, but it's so. nice to have the camaraderie, you know, each other. OK, Michael birthdays. Ferguson, happy birthday to you as well. Um, you've been a loyal deputy for a couple of years now. Uh, if in the event that you return to... Parliament uh, as a Liberal government but have to work in minority. What does that mean for Jeremy Rockliffe's leadership and will you be looking at putting your hand up again as, as you've considered in the past? Thanks Emily. Um, yeah, what I want to see occurring in the future is to continue to serve as deputy in a majority Liberal government and we'll accept the voters' wishes tonight. Of course we have to. Uh, but we've fought a tough campaign around really focusing the minds of our community on the real risks uh, that do exist should the state uh, choose to have a minority uh, of, uh, you know, no major party having a majority. We've tried to raise that risk because I've lived through a minority government. I know how bad it is. Uh, and I say that with respect I'm going to, to, I'm going to interrupt you, Michael Ferguson. And my, and, I'm going to interrupt and my you because is the, to continue the, in that way with Jeremy. the polls are showing, Michael Ferguson, that you won't be returning in majority. So let's talk about that situation. I uh, understand you're saying you'd be happy to be deputy, deputy if it is a majority. If it's not, what does that mean for Jeremy Rockley's leadership again? And will you be putting your hand up? Oh, well, look, I want to see Jeremy Rockliffe retain his role as Premier, and that's what I've stood for during this campaign. And despite plenty of uh, uh, free advice from media and other politicians, that's been my continued position. I've got no difficulty making that my position in the future. What Tasmania needs from me 
and our government is stability. And from every single politician that's elected tonight, you mentioned, Emily, the polls. The polls are now irrelevant. There's been the poll taken today. Mm. I look forward to seeing the results coming in later tonight, hopefully soon. And I hope that they're positive. And I hope that our message has resonated with voters. But of course, we'll all now wait and see. Emily, if I Michael. can just jump in for a moment. Michael Ferguson, it's Leon Compton here. I mean, but to try and drill down into Emily's question, what is the bar that Jeremy Rockcliffe has to clear tonight. He went to the party room. He said, there we are, I will do better than a two-seat minority. What is the bar he needs to pass before we start counting the votes and getting you know, answers to how the electorate feels about this? Well, no more hypotheticals, Leon, and it's good evening to you instead of good morning. No more hypotheticals. The people have now spoken. We now need to understand what the numbers are. Jeremy will continue to have the support of the party room, in my judgment. Uh, he'll continue to have my support as well. But the bar here is for us to respond to what the Tasmanian voters uh, have sent to the Tasmanian Parliament. That is the MPs who are elected from whatever party. And now we will need to uh, work through that and hopefully, if, uh, hopefully secure a majority, and I expect that that'll take two weeks to determine. And Michael Ferguson, I'll, I'll chime back in. Let's talk about something that has happened in that case, the campaign. Now, we've seen a really um, interesting campaign, I think, from the Liberal Party. You've been in government for 10 years, but I think there's been this strategy to, to campaign almost like an opposition. You haven't been pointing so much to your record as pointing to the future. Can you tell me why, why that decision was made to campaign in that way? Was it that you were unwilling to campaign on your record? Or uh, what, are, what are the reasons that we've, we've seen this uh, unique sort of 10 years? in campaign from you. Yeah, thanks, Emily. That's a really interesting question because your question surprises me in that sense because I believe we have campaigned on our record. We have reminded Tasmanians of just what a hole Tasmania was in uh, coming out of a minority Labor Green government, how bad things were. We are in recession. We lost 10,000 jobs, nearly lost 20 schools, uh, lost so much opportunity. Um, and coming through 10 years of a majority Liberal government, uh, we've been able to restore confidence, a strong economy and over 50,000 additional jobs and a growing population. So I believe we have campaigned on our record, um, but it's always been in a context of what should the future look like going forward and how can we ensure that as a state we take opportunity and uh, use it to our advantage and indeed look after those Tasmanians who really, like so many Australians by the way, who have struggled with the cost of living pressures because of not state inflation, national and global inflation. And pointing to that future, we've often talked about 2030. That's because we wanted to make it about immediate actions that we want to do right now, next 100-day plans out there, but also where that takes us in terms of Tasmania's longer-term future. Michael Ferguson, you must be waking up in the night going, strong plan, strong plan. So thank you so much for taking the time on your birthday as, as you're sharing it with other Liberal MPs. Uh, and we'll uh, talk to you later in the evening. Thank you. Now, Michelle... Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Michelle O'Byrne is a Labor MP in Bass, and we're going to go to her now. She's at the Invermay Bowls Club in Bass. Michelle O'Byrne, thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me. I feel as if I've been a member for 127 years now. <laughs> Looking back at the campaign, now that the polls have closed, what did you do well? What could and should Labor have done differently? Well, what I think we do well and what we always do well is around connecting with community and the fact that we have not possibly the money that some of our opponents have, but that ability to get volunteers out on the door, out in community, talking up um, their, the policies that they matter about, us having conversations on the doors in community, I think that's the thing that we have always excelled at. Um, I focus very much on my own campaign up here, but I do think that that's the message that I saw as I watched Labor candidates and members campaigning right around the state. Michelle O'Byrne, you are a Tasmanian Labor veteran, as, as you've just acknowledged. Uh, why is it that you think that Tasmanian voters are not warming to the Tasmanian Labor message? Well, I think we still have to see how today goes. Um, the only way that we're really going to know is uh, whether or not people have adopted our positive plans, our plans around health, around cost of living, around ensuring people have somewhere safe to live and the ability to afford to live. Um, it's going to be tested in the details that come out over the next few weeks. I don't think it's clear what the outcome for Tasmanians are. I know on the door um, they were very angry with this government, this government that forced them to yet another early election in order to shore up its ability to, uh, to have majority government, something which I'm 
I'm pretty sure we'll see them fall short of tonight. But going into this evening, uh, given the dysfunction we've seen uh, within the government in the last year or so, would you not have expected Labor to be in a better position perhaps than they are right now going into tonight? I think community have been disappointed in parliaments and governments for some time, uh, both here in Tasmania but around, uh, around the world. So I think there is a reasonable cynicism. I think we've presented a positive message to them and I think when we've spoken about that message on the doors and in community, it's been accepted really well and embraced really well. As to how it goes in terms of the counting of the polls tonight, well, I'm afraid only time is going to tell. And can I ask Michelle O'Byrne, it's been a, a tough year in some ways um, and even since the last election we've seen some dysfunction within Tasmanian Labor. Uh, can I ask whether your personal commitment to the Tasmanian Labor cause has, has wavered at all in this period? Look, uh, you would know, uh, Emily, that I lost a family member, uh, a die-hard Labor mother during this time, and I think my, my commitment to a lot of things wavered for a little while in the okay. wake of that okay. loss. But I've always been Labor. I'm a member of the National Executive. I'm utterly committed to us getting majority government. In the absence of majority government, I'm absolutely sure that only Labor can do the work that would mean that we could actually get any kind of consensus on bills on the floor in the Tasmanian Parliament. We've seen the Liberal government fail to do that time and time again. It's the reason we're having this conversation tonight and not a year down the track. Michelle O'Byrne, it's Leon Compton. You were sidelined in this campaign. Who made that decision? I've spent my time on the doors in my community yeah, you, uh, doing what I respect, do best. You, I'm, you a, as you know, a veteran campaigner. Yeah, you are, and you are very good at it. You're good at retaining your seat. You're a stalwart of the Labor Party, and you were sidelined. You played no public role in this campaign. Who made that decision, and do you think it was a good one? I, made a, I had a public role in my electorate, which is where I was focusing. I did in some of my uh, portfolio areas as well. Um, the reality is that the portfolios that we were driving on around health, around cost of living, aren't the ones that I get to speak on every day um, for the party. But I certainly spoke on them at the doors and in my community. Michelle O'Byrne, thanks for your time. Thanks, Leon. Yeah, that was Michelle O'Byrne. Yeah. Nika Electric Bratton, Milatina Mapia Bratton Prumi, Loiti Palua, Ningampi Nungampi Nini Manta Manta, Pirapi, Piriloinia, Takaina, Tumikini and Munu, Takara Taputi Katina Makuminia, Ninginakani Luuti Natu, Miri Nitipa, Taralankana Rina, Lua Makuna, Kuparina Krakani, Palanawina Mapali, Waranta Lakapawa Lumi, Palua Mapali Loiti Nika Milatinata, Limilina Turi, Patawai, Premangana, Palua Milatina. You're watching Tasmania Votes live from Hobart. I'm Sabra Lane. And I'm Guy Stainer. We'll bring our panel back in now. Erica Betts, we've heard some interesting stuff from yourself, also from Michael Ferguson, where it's really noticeable that the language has changed the moment the polls have closed. All of the time, the Liberal Party has been talking about majority government, majority government, majority government. In the last 15 minutes, we've heard both of you talk about it's quite likely that you will be in minority. What is the magic number for you in terms of seats that would make a minority government manageable for the Liberal Party? That's a big hypothetical, but first, if I may say, uh, up until 6pm, we were campaigning for majority Liberal government. If the Tasmanian people speak in a different manner to that for which we were advocating, then we come into the situation we're talking about now. And So the aspirational I would have thought, I would have gets replaced with the, the realist yeah. once, oh, once 6 oh, o'clock? Uh, Oh, of course, and, and that is what campaigns are always all about, seeking to convince, in this case, your fellow Tasmanians to vote Liberal, vote a majority government in, and we've been successful in doing that on a number of occasions. Whether we're successful on this occasion remains to be seen. But I would have thought to form a minority government, uh, the Liberals would need minimum 
15 seats, I would have thought, uh, to then get together with some others. But look, all that, it remains who the others are. That needs to be determined. And at the end of the day, we've got a very good person to determine all that in our Premier, Jeremy Rockliffe. Is he the chap, though, to, if, if that's what plays out here tonight, and given the way that he's been very critical about independence and minority government, is he really the man to lead those sorts of negotiations, given he's rubbished it? <coughs> Look, uh, I think everybody accepts that uh, you campaign during an election for a certain outcome, and then when and if that doesn't quite occur, then there may need to be a determination as to uh, how you make the parliament work for the benefit of the people of Tasmania. And what the Premier did quite rightly in calling this early election, the Liberals had been elected on the basis of Liberal majority stable government. Two people left the Liberal Party, denied majority, but then in the end it was the stability factor and that is the factor that is of most concern to our fellow Tasmanians. That was denied and that is why it went to an, an early election and we'll see what the people decide tonight. Well, it's, it's interesting to hear the rhetoric because it has changed, Eric, with respect. I think in previous elections it's been, well, govern in majority or not at all. So there has been a softening in that rhetoric. Is that just a, It's not just because it's six o'clock, surely that's just a reality check. Well, what happened, and Nick McKim was part of that uh, government, uh, the last minority government delivered us recession. Oh, okay. 200 nurses were sacked. Schools were being oh, closed. Sorry, back, back to the question, so, though, about the changing and, rhetoric, not uh, about what happened no, no, and so back what, in 2010. Uh, and so what the Liberals are asking for and have continually sought is majority government. Until 6pm this evening. Because the history of minority government has been, unfortunately, chaos in the economy, chaos in the community. We now have chaos in the parliament. We will see what the people determine this evening and then it'll be up to Jeremy Rockliffe and his colleagues to determine how that may look. Sarah Lovell, can I come to you about the change in language that we've been hearing just in less than an hour? Your response? Yeah, um, well, I, I mean, I have a question for Eric. Um, what does this mean for the commitments that the Liberal Party have made to Tasmanians in the lead-up to this election? All of the election promises made by Jeremy Rockcliffe and by the Liberal team were on the basis of a majority Liberal government. A majority Liberal government will, so on. What does that mean then for all of those commitments that were made to Tasmanians and does the party stand by them if you don't win a majority government? So, Sarah, it's pretty simple and I would have thought most Tasmanians understand that the only thing Jeremy Rockcliffe could promise to the Tasmanian people is that which he promised if he had the numbers in the Parliament. If he is denied the numbers in the Parliament, then he has no guarantee of being able to deliver those promises because the crossbench and the Greens and Labor may deny him the opportunity to, to, to deliver on those policies. I would have thought it's very, very simple and clear for the people of Tasmania and it was the only promise that the Premier could make. If there were a majority, then that is what he would do. If he's denied the majority, how can he do it if the Parliament potentially votes against his promises? Well, doesn't that raise concerns then about his own confidence in his ability to manage a minority government and be able to deliver those promises and his agenda? Well, no, what it does is reflect on the independence and the minority within the parliament as to whether they're willing to honour the party promises that gained the most support from the Tasmanian people. And that is where they need to search their conscience as to whether they want to be um, denying the majority, not the majority, but the largest vote of the Tasmanian community from being able to deliver that which they sought to deliver. All right, we're going to hit pause on this conversation right now. I understand, Anthony, you've got first figures for yeah, us. We'll just, we'll just run through some figures for lines that come in, we'll, just mainly to explain our graphics at this stage. So that's the election of Lions. The members for Lions at the moment are uh, Guy Barnett and Mark Shelton for the Liberal Party, John Tucker, the ex-Liberal, became independent, and Jen Butler and Labor leader Rebecca White. If you look at the party totals, these are tiny numbers at this stage. I'll just, so I'll just explain how we're doing things tonight. We show each of the party groups on the ballot paper as they appear on the ballot paper. 
Uh, we then move on to we can look at the leading candidates for each party. So at this stage, that's the way the votes are. As expected, Rebecca White may have the highest poll. And then we're also able to look at the change in vote in this electorate so that the votes are down for Labour and Liberal and Jackie Lambie Network. Up. This is one, uh, it's three polling places now. So they're coming in. When I first look at these figures, they were just broad marsh. But um, over the next half hour, we'll run through all the figures we've got more systematically. But I just thought it was... Uh, useful to explain. We'd seen some board numbers come up on the tally board, so I got nervous when they weren't in the computer, but they finally arrived. Anthony, thank you very much for that. Now we're going to cross to Rosalie Woodruff, the Greens leader. Ros Rosalie, I understand that you're with us. Okay. Rosalie, you're joining us from the Overland Brewery at North Hobart, which is in your seat of Franklin. Uh, how are you feeling about tonight? It's in the seat of Clark and oh, it's uh, a yeah. fantastic mood in the room here. It's extremely joyous energy behind me. Uh, people uh, have been uh, on the, you know, voting today but campaigning hard for uh, weeks now and um, we're just really excited to, to finally be at this point. Rosalie Woodruff, Guy Stainer here. Is tonight's vote going to be in some way a referendum on your leadership of the Greens? Well, it's going to be listening to what Tasmanians really want. And we've been fighting so hard for this last uh, five-week campaign, the SNAP election, to continue to talk about uh, the issues for renters, uh, people who can't get a bed in the hospital and, and people who can't be reached by triple O calls. And, of course, the Greens have been standing up for our environment and the protections that we desperately need for native forest logging, uh, to, to stop native forest logging and burning. So it's been an incredible opportunity for us in this period of time and um, you know we've uh, collectively worked hard and felt the momentum of Tasmanians. Rosalie Woodruff, we've heard I think uh, something of an extraordinary softening from both major parties in the past even what time is it? 54 minutes about uh, their willingness to work uh, in, in a minority government. Now it's looking like uh, you'll have at least two seats in the parliament. Uh, who would you like to work with uh, in, as an incoming government? We have been campaigning really hard to get rid of this Liberal government and the last 10 years has shown what a mess Tasmania is in now under their leadership. And so we have uh, really wanted to uh, to bring about the change that we know is possible. And we've heard from people in the community about what they want uh, in the next term of government. They want real action for renters. They want real homes to be built. Uh, they want hospitals uh, and, and health uh, fixes to the health system. And they want to protect the environment and have action on climate. And we've shown that as a, as a party, the members in Parliament in the last term of Parliament, uh, we were able to deliver change. Uh, we got an ambulance ramping inquiry up. We passed whistleblower legislation. We've effectively set the agenda on this uh, election. Public transport has been talked about. Now, um, cost of living, a short stay accommodation reforms and regulations, none of this would have been talked about by the Liberal and Labor parties if the Greens hadn't been standing there fighting with the community to get action on these big issues. Thank you, Rosalie Woodruff. OK, we're going to go back to Anthony Green now for some more figures. Anthony? Uh, I've had a little chance to look at the numbers before talking this time. So let's look at Bass, uh, the northeastern electorate. Michael Ferguson and Simon Wood. Simon Wood replaced Sarah Courtney. Lara Alexander replaced. Uh, sorry, Simon Wood replaced Peter Gutwin. Lara Alexander replaced Sarah Courtney, and since left the Liberal Party. And Michelle O'Byrne and Janie Finlay. Um, about the, the two Labor members. Look at the party totals at the moment. The Liberal Party's on 41%. Now, this is corrected for where the votes are from. So these are just aren't raw numbers. The quotas, which we'll look at later, are on the raw numbers. But we're projecting the Liberal Party to 41. This is only one polling place, which was Gladstone, which I think is a small rural area. The Jackie Lammy network is polling very strongly. If we look at the change in vote, and this is what's interesting at the moment, the Liberal vote well down, the Jackie Lammy network well up. Now, whether that is just because this is one polling place, whether that follows for the larger centres like Launceston, we'll be watching later. But that's the first figures we've got for Bass, and we've got some other ones to come. 
Mm. Anthony, can I just jump in for a moment? Would that be OK? Anthony, I'm hearing from a scrutineer in the north. They're seeing a lot of informal ballots, ballots that are coming through with crosses and ticks or not fully numbered or blank. Are we going to be able to tell what sort of... Uh, get some details through the night about how that informal vote actually looks? We will get the informal vote tonight and we'll be able to make a comparison with last time. But, yeah, they do report the informal on the night. Mm. Thanks, Anthony. Nick McKim... 15% vote for the Jackie Lambie network so far in Bass. Very early figures, I know. But is there a danger that the Greens will no longer be the third party in Tasmanian politics? Oh, I honestly don't think so, Guy. Um, like they may be going well in Gladstone. It's a very small uh, booth in uh, you know a regional part of a regional electorate. I'd expect that to come down over time. But look, I listened closely to what Eric was saying and a couple of reflections. I mean, firstly, it's great to see the Tasmanian Liberals finally embracing a policy of recycling, Eric. But secondly, uh, what I want to say <laughs> is... What about yourself, Nick, well, going from state to federal? Well, Eric, I'm going federal Eric, to I listened state. Pottle, very, very, pot very carefully to what, you, to what you said about instability. Let's be clear about this. The biggest agent of instability in the next parliament is going to be you, because it's well known that you want Jeremy Rockliffe's job, and you are sharpening the knife as we sit here tonight to slip it in between his shoulder blades as soon as you possibly can with Michael Ferguson uh, alongside you. So we all know that's the case, and uh, you Nick, are the biggest Nick, Nick, agent you of instability a that this state is facing into the the future. Is you do yourself a great disservice with that sort of silly commentary. We all know it's it true. It does Eric. you a great disservice. We all know it's true, and, and I know you haven't I, denied it. I am saying that you're doing yourself a great oh, disservice no, because, no, because yeah. if you wouldn't have interjected, I would have categorically and utterly denied oh, it. We'll My only we'll reason for seeking a seat was one, there's a vacancy in Franklin, I believe that from two seats the Liberals can go up to three seats. And the reason I got into federal politics, why I'm seeking to get into state politics, is summed up in one word, service. Yes. I want to serve the people, and that is what motivates me. And uh, I think Tom my track that. record Tom over that up. time shows that I've always been a team player, irrespective of what cards I might be dealt from sure. time to time. Sure. No ambition to be leader, even if Jeremy Rockcliffe stumbles in the look, next couple of weeks, given what he's had to say about minority governments? Look, we don't call him Jay Rock for nothing. Not only does he rock, his leadership is absolutely rock solid. And amongst the 35 candidates with whom I've spoken, there has not been any talk about leadership whatsoever. All right. Now, listen, we're going to head to the moment for, to Selena. Selena Ross at the big board. Selena, what have you got for us? So before any seats are called, we wanted to introduce you to our other graphic tonight, and we call that the pathway to power. And what's that, what that's going to show us is who's in the best position to form a government as those results are coming in. So if we take you over here, this block here shows us the 35 seats that are up for grabs, the five electorates with the seven seats in each of those. Now, at the moment, they're black. That means they're in doubt, which applies to all of them at the moment. But as a seat is called the square will be coloured in. If the Liberals win it, it will move over to this side of the board and fill up one of these squares here. If Labor wins it, it will move down into this red section here. Now, the goal for both of the major parties is to fill their entire square up to this yellow line here. If they do that, they've won 18 seats. They will have the majority and they will be able to form a government in their own right. Anything to the right of the yellow line would be a bonus. But if neither of the major parties are able to do that, if both of them fall short and can't reach that yellow line, that means we have a hung parliament and we're headed for a minority government. Now, that would also mean that some of these seats over here have been won either by an independent or one of the minor parties as well. And in that case, we would have a crossbench forming here in the middle. So, Guy and Sabra, we're going to see, as these results come in, who's in the best position to form government and if they need to rely on the crossbench in order to do it. Selena Ross, thank you. Sarah Lovell, there's been a lot of talk about a coalition of chaos. That phraseology has been uh, repeated by Erica Betts tonight. How do you feel when these former minority governments are categorised as coalitions of chaos? Well, it's interesting because it's looking, you know, increasingly likely through the campaign that it may be Jeremy Rockcliffe who has his own coalition of chaos and he's the one that coined that term and indeed that's why we're in this position and having this election. Um, I think 
there have been minority governments in the past that haven't delivered for Tasmania. Well, certainly what we've heard from Tasmanians is that they want majority governments. That's why we were campaigning for majority government. But the reality is, is that we're seeing nationwide a trend towards independence, minor parties. People are looking for something different from their parliament now. I think the key now is looking at who is best placed to be able to make that type of parliament work. You know, I sit in the Legislative Council. We deal with that sort of environment every day. We negotiate with independent members. We talk across parties. We do that sort of work all the time. So I think that's a good example of where you can look and see who's done that well in the past, which governments have been able to get through important pieces of legislation and which governments have not managed to do that well. For most of the campaign, so, well, for all of the campaign from Jeremy Rockliffe, from most of the campaign from Rebecca White, they refused to even discuss the term minority government. Why is that phrase considered electoral kryptonite when most of us are just thinking that's going to be the reality? Yeah. Well, look, Rebecca White said fairly early on, we were always campaigning for majority government because, to be honest, that's what we hear loud and clear from people in the community, that that's what they want, a majority government in Tasmania. Is I, it actually I electoral death I, to look, say, yes, we may have to talk to someone if the votes fall well, that way? I think what Rebecca did quite early on was say, we're campaigning for majority government, that's what we're working towards, but we will respect the will of Tasmania and we will work with yeah. whoever is elected in the parliament to get through a Labor legislative Sorry. agenda to get through, get our policies through, um, to, to work and to work in a cohesive and a collaborative and a productive way, which I, is what hang, not hang I sat down with her and specifically asked, what is the pathway to you becoming a Premier? And she refused to countenance even the possibility that she might have to talk to somebody else. She spoke about converting a 23 per cent uh, first preference vote in the latest poll and converting that into 50 per cent. Now, surely that just tells the voters that the leader's talking in la-la land. Well, we've always been campaigning for majority government, but I heard her say very early on and a number of times that we will respect the will of Tasmania. Um, our policies were not contingent on a majority Labor government. We will respect the will of Tasmania and we will work with the parliament that is elected. Sarah Lovell, you've had a go in the health portfolio as shadow in your time in parliament. When you think about the most challenging issue to defend for the Liberal Party, it's their performance in health. Tasmanians have, you know, terrible outcomes when it comes to ambulance ramping, real challenges in getting admitted to hospitals and through EDs and the list goes on. If, what does it say about your ability to campaign that you haven't, it seems, been able to really shift the needle on that issue through the course of this election? Um, and who ultimately will take responsibility for that if you can't convince a significant number of people to come your way tonight? Well, I think we did campaign strongly on health, along with housing and cost of living. We had really good policies that I'm very proud of in those areas, strong messaging in those areas. But it's no secret that the strength of Labor Party campaigns has always been the on-the-ground, grassroots, knocking on doors, conversations with people. When you knock on a door and you have a conversation with someone about the health system and their experience or the experience of someone that they love and care about and you talk to them about our policies, they, those conversations were really well received. The problem we have, though, is that, and this is something that we need to look at as a party, we need to grapple with this, is people are not home the way they used to be anymore. You can go door knocking in an area for two hours, you might have eight conversations. You go back to that same place the next day, you'll find eight different people. So I think we as a party need to be looking at where are we meeting people and how are we having those conversations in a way that people are ready to receive them and hear that message so that we can um, get, you know, five week campaign, it's policy overload, there's a lot for people to take in. We've got to look at how we can get face to face with people and cut through in that way. All right, we're just going to hit pause on that conversation for a moment. Anthony Green, you've got some interesting figures for us in Braddon. Yes, we've got some figures from Braddon now. This is, uh, as is always the case in Braddon very early, you get the circular head vote, which to explain for the mainland is the council in this part of Tasmania. Um, the party totals that we're seeing at this stage, the Liberal Party's projected to be in the low 50s at this stage, Labor Party 
it's projected to be very low. I suspect that's um, a, a, an artifact fact of the early figures. Craig Garland is doing very well at this stage. He always does well in that part of uh, that far northern northwestern corner. If you look at the change in vote that's occurring here at this stage, the Liberal vote swell down. The Labor vote's roughly exactly where it was last time. No particular change. Jackie Lambie network up 8.5 percent. Actually, I've just realised the number I wanted to. That's the change in vote. If I look at the party totals. One of my graphics has disappeared. That's what the numbers are at the moment in Braddon. So at this stage, uh, good figures for the Liberal Party on the early figures and not, not so good figures for the Labor Party. All right, Anthony, thank you very much for that. We've got some interesting figures there. No early figures, the Jackie Lambie network. Uh, now the woman who heads that network, Jackie Lambie, joins us now from the Launceston RSL in South Launceston. You're not actually standing yourself, but your candidates look like they might have picked up a little bit of support across Tasmania, especially in the north. How are you feeling? Um, you know what, they've been out there. They have worked their butts off, to be honest with you. We don't have the money that the major parties have. It is out there at the traffic lights, at the roundabouts. It's waving to everybody. It's out there communicating. It's out there showing up in as many forms as we possibly can. And then it's, it's, it obviously, it does come down to me performing and, and putting into performance out there that last four to five weeks, getting every gig I possibly can to raise our portfolio. Senator, I'm going to quote from you from during the campaign. You said, we're never going to make policies because we're never going to be in government. However, it looks like your candidates may be in the House of Assembly, which is where legislation is, is passed and where the government is formed. Uh, you've campaigned on transparency, uh, being open and accountable, integrity. Have you dudded Tasmanians by not telling voters what your candidates actually believe on issues that are crucial? I acknowledge before you do that you had some policy principles that you set out, but in terms of things like social issues or particular pieces of legislation, we haven't had any clear messaging. You know, we haven't from the we haven't from the Liberal Party either because they've got commitments. They've got to a point where they've even dropped their policies and saying commitments. And what we do know is that the Tasmanian people, if they are re-elected in government, they're going to say if they've got to go into power with independence or with Jack and networks, they're going to water all that down. I'll tell you that right now because they'll say we didn't get a majority. We didn't get a majority, and we only promised this on a majority. So that is the first um, first problem that we have. Uh, our people are out there talking to people. People can see where I stand. I've been up there long enough in the Senate. They know I stand for integrity. They know I stand for truth. They know, I, you know, they know where I stand on everything. They know the houses I've delivered down here. Uh, you know, they know what we've done for health down here. This is what we're all about. What's the point in having policy out there when most of them can't stick to it? So that's our choice. We will fight like hell for Tasmanians. We will look at those bills. We will look at that ledge. We will make it as best as we possibly can if we have the influence to make change on that, um, which hopefully we will. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to be like police on the beach. We're going to bring integrity back in the state of Tasmania. That's the first thing we're going to do. And what we're going to do is truth and advertising. And we're going to look at those political donations and take them back to where they should have been, down to that $1,000 point. Because quite frankly, we've had enough. Senator, let's talk about this uh, potential minority government because you could play or your candidates could play a crucial role. Now, you've brought up truth in advertising. I know you were quite annoyed about the um, false website that the Liberal Party put out. And your own actual website yeah. is quite clear about uh, your or the need for change in your view. Uh, would you support the Liberal Party in minority government or are you more likely to support Labor? I got, a, I got a message through to Jeremy Rockcliffe yesterday, they're trying to hunt me down already, the Liberals, and I said, put, you know, if you wanted some goodwill and you want to put the hand out to the Lambies, put, shut that down where it's all down on yesterday. That still has not been done. He has not showed goodwill. That has not been helpful. He just can't help himself. If anyone brings down the Liberal Party, it will be Jeremy Rockcliffe himself. It's been played really stupidly. It has not been smart politics. I say this to the, I say this to both Liberal and Labor. Uh, look at federal. Look at what's going on. Look at what's going on around the rest of the world because there are independents and micros coming in, and majors are going out. That's where we are in the 21st century. So to be very clear, Senator Lambie, are you ruling out uh, a deal with the Liberal Party to allow them that would allow them to govern the state? You know what? It's not up to me, but I'm telling you how my people would, how my people feel right now. When that sort of behaviour, that sort of behaviour and leadership, they just roll in their eyes back saying, you are kidding me. Uh, this is going to be quite difficult for them, I would imagine. 
um, to be able to support th support them. Of course, if Jeremy wants to come in and ma wave his magic wand around, be my guest. Um, but seriously, we're going to watch the numbers, we're going to see who's elected, we're going to see what sort of personalities they have, and then of course it'll be up to the guys that are elected in state parliament to choose what they are going to do for the Jackie Lambie network. And what, what's your personal view, Senator Lambie, should the Liberals be given another term? Look, um, my personal view is um, they have done a really crap job in the last 10 years. That's going to be a problem in itself. Uh, does that mean, is it going to be a Labor Green government with Jackie Lambie Network? Because we know, especially up in the north here, what a Green Labor government looked like beforehand. So it's really going to come down to the mix. Uh, my people are going to watch that. Look, my people, we may only get just a couple up, and that means that they sit on the sidelines and let everybody else go over and make deals with the Liberal Labor Party. and. Uh, you know, watch what happens with that in the next 12, 12 months to two years. That's where we're at. So it may just come to them to say, you know what, we don't want to take the risk, we don't want to hurt the brand, we'll sit on the sidelines and everybody else can go and make government. Who knows? We just don't know until we see what that looks like in both major parties and what, who's taken what seats. But, but can I ask, Jackie, Erica Betts here, uh, if the Governor asks, test the numbers on the floor of the Parliament, before I determine who should be Premier, um, what would the Jackie Lambie Network do? Would they simply not vote in the Parliament in relation to uh, the will of the Jackie Lambie Network voters who have elected representatives into the State Parliament? Oh, sorry, I can't, I'm not sure if I've got you quite clearly right. here, but let me get this right. The reason they're voting for the Jackie Lambie Network is over transparency and integrity. And they're expecting us to make a decent decision if we have that choice to form government. And quite frankly, your side has done a really crap job of it. It's been very violated against me as my face of my party. They're not off to a good start. They're not reaching out, really. They had a okay, choice Eric, Eric Bex, Bex, and, and Sorry, Senator Lambie. Sorry, Senator Lambie and Erica Betts. We'll have to move on. Uh, thank you for your time, Senator Lambie. Thank you so much. Clark Electorate Nuritina Kriwa Kriwalaiti Nipaluna Lakarana Liprina Mowinina Nipaluna Nuritina Rala Palawa Prungi Manta War Kunani Ningina Makuminya Nini Mapia Lutuwita Luwili Tintumilinania Nika Makuminya Nuritina Palawa Mapali Manta Manta Takara Ngaipi Riawina Kanapli la mapi a patrula pula wini, kunani nini na warana pailiti. You're watching Tasmania Votes live from Hobart. I'm Guy Stoner. And I'm Sabra Lane. It's a quarter past seven here in Hobart. Let's get the latest with the count. Anthony Green. Well, we're going to do an overview. What's the statewide figure at the moment? These are projected numbers on vote share. We're projecting the Liberal Party to be 35, Labor 29, Greens 14, Jackie Lambie Network 9.5, Independence 5.9, another 6.9. Um, the one caveat I'll put on that, there's nothing from Franklin or Clark. I expect the independent vote to go up once Franklin and Clark start to report. There's no Jackie Lambie candidates in Clark, and they probably won't do as well in Franklin. So I, that may be the maximum vote they get tonight. We, we can't really do a projection of that. It's a simple aggregation. But if you look at the change in vote, um, the, at the moment, <clears throat> mainly rural booths, from those northern areas the liberal vote is well down and it's the jackie lambie network where it's up everyone else not much change so uh, as i said it's only 1.4 statewide it's only the three northern and rural electorates uh, at the moment that's what the trend looks like we'll see if that proceeds on for the next half hour or so all right, Anthony, thank you very much for that it's still pretty early in the count tonight let alone that it will continue for weeks eric betts i'm going to go to you about what Jack jackie lambie just had to say she sounding a little bit burnt by what happened with um, you know, the Liberal Party fake ads, fake site. It sounds like if, if we get to that position, and it's hypothetical, you need their support, 
Is the Liberal Party prepared to make any concessions to the Jackie Lambie Network MPs to get them on site? Well, it's going to be a question as to what is being asked of the Liberal Party. But first, uh, let me be clear, I think the Liberal Party was entitled to point out the fact that the Jackie Lambie Network basically bragged about the fact that they had no policies to offer the people of Tasmania. And in fairness, if you want a seat in the Parliament, the people are entitled to know what you might be voting for or against, what your philosophical framework is. And what Jackie Lambie they're, has they're done front, very well... They were upfront about that. They oh, were upfront by oh, saying we don't have policies. Oh. They were up front and uh, I think what the Liberal Party sought to do was to flush that out and I think achieved that to a certain extent because uh, people then became aware of that. But what Jackie Lambie Network has done I think quite well is uh, become a protest uh, movement and if those early figures are an indication the vote hasn't shifted from Liberal to Labor but to a halfway house in the Jackie Lambie network uh, where there is a sense of this is a bit of a protest vote but people don't really know what they're voting for and I would have thought in the core light of day the party that gets the, mo the most vote the highest vote should be the one that uh, forms government and I think the Jackie Lambie Network members would be obliged to consider that very seriously. Emily Blake. I'm just going to quote to you, Erica Betts, from during the campaign, in fact, the latest debate this week. Jeremy Rockcliffe said, I will not be trading away any ministries and I will not be trading away any policies. You've just said it depends what's being asked. Uh, why, why has that changed between today and oh. Wednesday? Oh, well, then, there's a no, no difficulty with that at all. Um, it depends on what Jackie Lambie Network asks. And if they ask for things that Jeremy Rockcliffe cannot and will not deliver, then there's no deal. I would have thought that's pretty obvious. So what's up for grabs in that case? Oh, well, it depends what they ask. And given that they had no policies, we don't really know what the Jackie Lambie Network might be asking for. If they ask for things that are doable, and this is all hypothetical, but fingers crossed we might still get there to majority government, but if that's not the case, then there's some of the discussions that are had and uh, it depends on what the requests are. If the requests are too demanding, then the Premier may well say, well, that's too much, we can't do a deal. If they're reasonable requests, uh, the Premier can say, well, that does not impinge on my philosophy, on my policy platform. We can do business. Let's wait and see. We don't know what their request is going to be. Sarah Lovell, can I take this over to you? If it is possible that Labor gets significantly fewer or fewer seats than the Liberal Party, I've got some people telling me that Labor at the moment are positioning themselves to throw a Hail Mary, if you like, and to try and win government um, from minority and from some way back of the Liberal Party. Is that an approach that you would support? Or indeed, are you involved in that? thinking at the moment? Uh, no, I don't think Labor's positioning ourselves to do anything. We're waiting to see what comes through in the count. I think this is really squarely with the Premier to decide whether, and as the incumbent Premier, that will be his first responsibility as, as the incumbent government. He has the first responsibility to try and form a workable parliament. Um, so I think it really falls with him to see if he can make that work. If he can't make that work, then there's a range of options available to the Governor, um, to the Premier, uh, in terms of how we move forward. Um, but, look, we're not getting ahead of ourselves. We'll see how many seats each party ends up with at the end of the night, how many independents and minor party candidates are elected, and we will go from there. Well, speaking of how many seats we might get to at the end of the night, let's get the latest from Anthony Green. Well, um, you'll see I've started to colour in some spots here, and that's simply because even on very early figures, is, is clear the Liberals will win three seats in Braddon, Bass and Lyons and Labor's winning two in each of those. Um, they, just, they will prop Labor, the Liberals may win more, Labor may win more, but it's absolutely there, the minimum numbers that are there. Let's have a look at the figures for Lyons and we'll look at the party totals. We've sorted this out now, this is a projected number, I was a bit confused there for a moment. We're projecting the Liberal parties towards about 37, which is a definite three quotas. Labor parties 31, which was two and a bit. The Greens are currently a little bit under a quota. This is uh, on the raw numbers, this is where we're projecting. John Tucker's only polling 4.3%. The warning about Lyons is a very regional seat. 
and John Tucker's vote is mainly on the East Coast, I understand, where he was a councillor previously. So those numbers may bounce around as the numbers come in. But the change in vote at the moment is that figure. We're seeing the Liberal vote down, Jackie Lambie network up. Um, John Tucker's vote is up. So that's, that's the number. So the Liberals will be losing votes to both John Tucker and Jackie Lambie network at this stage in Lyons. Anthony, thank you very much for that. And speaking of John Tucker, he joins us now. He's at home in the seat of Lions. John Tucker, welcome. Thanks for joining our coverage. Thank you. How are you for feeling? Me on. How, how are you feeling about those early fi early figures showing uh, that you've increased your vote? I'm very happy with where I'm sitting at the moment. Um, yeah, considering what happened at the last election, where a lot of the booths where I was strongest came in at the end. So, yeah, I'm very happy where I'm sitting at the moment. John, according to Jeremy Rockcliffe, you're to shoulder half the blame for this early election. Looking back, was it all worth it? I'd do everything I did in the first place again. Um, I wouldn't change a thing, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, I don't see that as my fault um, that the election was called. That was solely the Premier's decision. Um, he had supply and confidence from myself and Lara Alexander. All he had to do was uphold Parliament decisions. And John, who are you more likely to support in forming government? Obviously the obvious answer may have been the Liberal Party until uh, earlier this year. Um, what I would say to you is let's just wait and see who, who gets elected and once we find that out then we'll think about what we're going to do first, first um, after that. I've got to get elected myself in the first place um, and let's see who else is elected. Sure, let's just keep playing in the hypotheticals at the moment, ones that may be likely. Uh, if, if Leon's intel is correct and I'm hearing the same thing, that, that Labor may try to form uh, a government from behind uh, with a crossbench, uh, is that something you'd be open to talking to them about? Do you feel like there is a need for change perhaps you would support the Labor Party? What I would say to you is that I'm open to discussions with everyone. I'm not going to lock myself in one way or the other. Um, I will discuss with everyone and I will be getting, trying to get the best outcome for my constituents of Lyons and that will be my focus going forward. John Tucker, it's Leon Compton. I mean, the issues that you left the party over were a stadium at Macquarie Point and questions about Marinus. I mean, they're exactly issues that the Labor Party have been campaigning on. Surely now they would more naturally be bedfellows for you if you had a choice in which way to show your loyalty. I'm not going to predict um, where I'm going to go, Leon. Um, but, yeah, that is true. The stadium and Marinus Link are big issues for myself especially Marinus Link. Um, so going forward, yes, they will be a big focus on what I think will be the best outcome for Tas my Tasmanian constituents in Lyons. And just especially. again, to, to follow up on that, surely if they were the issues that you left the party over and that has ultimately taken the state to an election, that you, it would seem we could be clearly understanding that that would be where you'd throw your support, the Labor Party, um, uh, if your support is asked for. Let's, let's just see what's put on the table by both parties before I make that decision. Um, but before that, I've got to get elected, um, number one, and let's see who is elected before we start to put hypotheticals out there and say this and say that. John Tucker, thanks for your time. Well, as uh, you can probably see behind me, the crowd is building and somewhere out there on the telly room floor is Alex. Sandra Alvaro and Alex, come in wherever you are. I believe you've got a guest for us. <laughs> I do. Uh, look, it's a bit of a who's who here. There's lots of people, political staffers, uh, politicians, um, and of course, here I have with me David and Hugh. Um, tell me, what's the reason for coming out here tonight? Oh, look, um, Hugh's doing a civics um, unit at school, and so I, we just thought we'd come and see how it plays out at the end of, uh, end of the election. And um, also knowing it's the last tally room in Australia, so just to have that experience as well, and just to see all the personalities and everyone about some of the candidates, Martin Delaney, for example, very finely dressed here tonight, and yeah, so just to be part of it and 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 just to give you a sense of it, and because you know, in the future it's going to be his world, and it'll be nice to see him engage with politics as well to a point, however he chooses, you know. Perfect. And Hugh, what's it like kind of seeing it all play out? Oh, it's really interesting, like seeing um, all the 
booms and all of that. It's really cool. Yeah, awesome. And I suppose for you guys, um, I don't know where you're from, maybe uh, suburb, suburbs around here? Yeah, yeah we're, we live um, out of Dromedary, so in Lyons. Perfect. And so what have been the major issues that you've that have been like front of mind for you during this election? Yeah, look, I think like everyone, you know, education, cost of living, health, um, you know, all the housing and what have you. I think the stadium, you know, it's been a big issue. It's come up. I think it's a bit of a red herring, you know. I think um, 150,000 people, you know, have signed up to that side. Um, there would probably be more if the stadium wasn't a bit divisive in it. And I think, you know, we should just call their bluff and say, yeah, call it the mainland football league if they, if they hold us to that contract. But, you know, that's one of the issues I think is clouding it a bit. Um, and yeah, so those are the issues. And I think for Hugh, um, and I don't really want to speak for him, but I mean, I think that um, you know, the environment and all those sort of things are going to come up in his life time. And you know, I think sometimes we probably need some more adults in the room other than perhaps Liberal and Labor. So not saying how I voted, but you know, I think that's important as well. So that, those are the issues for us. But certainly those really intimate issues like cost of living that hit everyone in the hip pocket, health. Yeah ramping all those things are really important yeah definitely uh, cost of living a huge one well thank you so much guy and sabra back to you thank you alex alvaro and I anthony green election analyst you got an update for us yes we've got some franklin figures uh this is one polling place in franklin it's from southport if you drive south from hobart you can't go any further than yeah. southport so it's right down the bottom of the electorate um now the labor party on that one polling place is trending towards 36, which would give them three seats. The Liberal Party, the high 30s, which was about two and a half quotas, and the Greens there over a quota. David O'Byrne doing all right. But again, one polling place in the far end of the electorate. Uh, what we can look at is we've got a few more figures in Clark, where there's a great deal of interest in uh, how this contest will go because of the uh, number of independents. Uh, the Liberal Party is on 25.9, projected to 25.9, which would be two quotas. They currently hold two seats. The Labor Party is predicted to mid-30s, which would put them on the way towards a third quota. Um, that's a, a raw number quota. We're, we're talking about projections here. The Greens are doing very well at the moment, 23.3. Um, that can vary depending on whereabouts in the electorate you come from with Clark. Now, Christy Johnson is on 9%. Sue Hickey not doing well, 2%. Again, depends what sort of electorate you are. And you've got um, Ben Loberger and um, Louise Elliott as the other two independents. So there's quite a vote there for independents. A lot more counting to come on in 1.2%. But I think it's very important to get people the sense that there are figures coming in. And we will go through those electorates in that order persistently through the night. Bass, Braddon, Lyons, Franklin, Clark. And we'll do them regularly. So if you keep watching the coverage, we'll keep coming back to your seat. Thank you, Anthony. Well, if you are keep watching the coverage, I suggest you uh, take a, a little look at the big board because we've got Selena Ross just over here who's going to give us an update on what's happening across the state. Well, the big update is that we have some colour on the board now, which is great now that Anthony has started calling seats. So we can see that he has called 15 seats and he's given three of those to the Liberals in, both, in all of Bass, Braddon and Lyons and two of them to Labor. So we can see their colours filling out those blocks there. And now the Liberal Party, if they want to win a majority, they really need to win four seats in each of these three electorates that we're seeing already because they're typically their three strongest electorates. The fact they've already got three this early in the night in all three of them is a really strong start for them. Now, if we come in, we can look at who we've got in so far, who through the quota system, who has a really high personal vote that we've already been able to show is in re-elected back into their seats in Parliament. We have the Liberal leader, Jeremy Rockcliffe, his deputy, Michael Ferguson, and Guy Barnett in Lyons. Also in Lyons, we have the Labor leader, Rebecca White. Now, Guy and Sabra, we know that all four of them have very strong personal votes, and so that's why they've been re-elected tonight. Thank you, Selena Ross at the Big Board. Erica Betts, uh, just having a look at some other figures in Franklin, it looks like you at the moment are top of the pops there. So I'm not sure if it's too early to say congratulations. Oh, look, um, I don't speculate about myself, but uh, somebody sent some figures in from a very tiny booth down the Hewan, suggesting I was topping the poll for the Liberals there, but somebody else sent in some figures.